book of Samuel, and uh, we'll be looking at chapter 7. You know, uh, Norris mentioned when, uh, that I might be overwhelmed uh, with the study. Uh, actually, I was overwhelmed in a very different way. Uh, when I heard we were going to study the book of Samuel, and I was assigned one chapter, I thought, how can I find half an hour or 40 minutes worth of material from one chapter to talk about? And that's what overwhelmed me. But I can tell you, as I studied this further, there are enough things that I learned, and I believe God shared with me during the study, that I think will be of edification to the saints here. So turn with me to the book of Samuel, uh, chapter 7. 1 Samuel, chapter 7. We are talking about a time that is about 3,000 years ago. And while I do like the study of history, sometimes I like to connect it to modern history. And chapter 7 is really a turning point in the history of the children of Israel. From those of you who have participated in the studies earlier, you know what happened to the children of Israel. They uh, went into some battles, which they did not win. And uh, it's at a very low point in their uh, time. And so they are uh, quite desperate. And when I look back at revivals and restorations that have happened to Christians and the Christian church, I was reminded of a time about 500 years ago uh, Martin Luther, it was actually in the month of October, almost exactly 503 years ago, he published his 95 Theses. And the ideas embodied in there were fairly revolutionary to a point where it sparked the Reformation movement and split the Protestant group from the Catholic Church. Martin Luther was used by God to spark a, a revolution. And we see in chapter 7 how Samuel was used in the same way. The message that Martin Luther preached and his 95 theses could be summarized in three basic elements. Salvation by faith alone, not of works. Bible is the only authority, not the Catholic Church, and the priesthood of all believers, not just ordained priests. These three elements form the basis of his 95 Theses. He strongly condemned many of the doctrines and the traditions of the Catholic Church that were going on at that time. More specifically, if you read through the 95 Theses, and I did just out of curiosity, just to understand, he strongly spoke about the practice of indulgences. Indulgences were a practice where you could get reduction in penalty of sins through this practice of indulgences. And it had become commercialized to a point where it was being bought, and there was a lot of money flowing around the practice of indulgences to a point where even the church couldn't get good control of it. And the 95 Theses strongly condemned it, and it brought out the truth. What we will see here in chapter 7 of Samuel was Israelites following false gods, getting entangled in wrong doctrines, and altogether at a very low point in their uh, time and in their history. So I want to read from verse 1, but I'll, uh, just for reference, read a few verses from chapter 6, because uh, chapter 7 starts with, uh, then the men. So let's go to verse 20 of chapter 6, just so that we have continuity. And the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy God? And to whom shall it go? from us. They're talking about the ark. So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kirjat Rarim, saying, the Philistines have bought back the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up with you. Then the men of Kirjat Jerim 
came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinabab on the hill and consecrated Eleazar his son to keep the ark. So it was that the ark remained in Kirjat Jerim for a long time, and it was there 20 years, and the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. The background and context is Eli and his sons are dead after a war with Philistines. Israel is under the bondage and control of Philistines after multiple losses in battle. Samuel continues to grow quietly as a prophet before the Lord. And the ark of the Lord was used by the children of Israel in a way that displeased the Lord. You know, the ark of the covenant was the most sacred object for the children of Israel. It was the evidence that God was going to be with them. During the desert journey, the ark went with the children of Israel, and it was used by Moses and Joshua in some battles. More recently, the ark was resident in Shiloh, and that is where it was for about 400 years. It was a bold and foolish decision on the part of the elders of the Israels to go and take this ark into battle. And the reason was not because the ark was not used in battle ever before. It was because the children of Israel did not have their heart right with God. They used the ark as a symbol to force God to get into battle with them and win. And Joel alluded to this in his last message. That is where they went wrong. And that is why, in spite of having the ark with them, they still lost the battle, and they still lost the ark. You know, observing church tradition and church practices without having a relationship with God is dangerous. And this is where the children of Israelites made a big mistake. You know, these days I see in the world, people use sometimes the Bible or a picture of Mary or, or, or picture of Jesus as an image. And they somehow use it as a symbol, as a way that somehow it can help them through difficult times. Okay? That is not going to work. What is most important to the Lord is, do you have a relationship with him? And that is what the Israelites missed here. They did not have a relationship with the Lord. They were against his commandments. The wrath of God was against them, and they lost the battle that they took the ark into in a very big way. And so that is one of the first lessons I would like to share today. Do not use the Bible just as a symbol. Okay? Make sure you obey what's in it and you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ as described in the Bible. The Israelites, by taking the ark into battle, dishonored God. Earlier in the book of Samuel, we see God honors those who honor him. Using the ark as a symbol to get God entangled in the battle and say, it's your battle, you got to win it, you cannot lose without having a heart for the Lord, was the big mistake. What we see here, then, is Israelites now are faced with a decision on what to do with the ark. And so they make the decision to move it to Kirjat Jerim. I'm not sure why they chose to move it there. If you look in this uh, map, hopefully this laser pointer will work, you'll see the Ark of the Lord was in Shiloh. It was there for hundreds of years. That's where Joshua had placed it along with the sacred tent. They took it to battle here in Ebenezer. It was under Israelite control. From there, it gets captured. 
and the Philistines move it to Ashdod. From Ashdod, it gets moved to Ekron, and from Ekron, it gets moved to Beth Shemesh, and now they are moving it to Kirjat Urim. So that's the routing the ark took. The blue signifies the control of the ark when it was in Israelite control, and the, re the orange shows where it moved while it was under Philistine control. And what we see happening now is the children of Israel understand they are, God is against them, and so now they are lamenting. That's what verse 2 says, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Lamentation, when I look up it in the dictionary, just means is a prayer for help from distress. And that is what we see happening at this time. Moving to verse 3. Verse 3, to me, is the key verse of this whole chapter. Then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, If you return to the Lord with all your hearts, and put away the foreign gods and the asterisks from among you, and prepare your hearts for the Lord, and serve him only, he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So the children of Israel put away the Baals and the Asherites and serve the Lord only. Verse 3 to me is the key verse in this chapter. And I would break down Samuel's message into three points. And this is what I call the revival br blueprint that Samuel spoke to the children of Israel. The three points are as follows. One, he spoke about devotion. Devotion, which means, and, and it ties to the heart. Return to the Lord with all your heart. Second point is doctrine. Samuel saw there was false doctrine and false gods that Israelites worshipped. Direct disobedience to the commandment of Jehovah. And so he wanted Israelites to change their doctrine. The third thing that I see Samuel talk about is serve Jehovah only, which reflects duty. So these are the three points that I find in verse 3. And to me, verse 3 is the most important verse in this chapter. Devotion, which is change of heart. Doctrine. Put away your false gods and duty, which is to serve Jehovah only. Let's look at each of these three points in further detail. If there is one topic you get from my message, remember this, because I believe even today these truths are applicable. Devotion of the heart, correct doctrine, and duty to our Lord. What does devotion mean? Devotion means love, interest, and loyalty. And it comes from the heart. This is where the Israelites had grown cold. What does the word heart mean? The Bible uses the word heart primarily to refer to the ruling center of the person. It is the spring of all desires. The heart is seen as the seat of will, of loyalty, and feelings. A modern term would be called character of a person. And it is distinct from the soul because the soul lives on after death. This is where the Israelites made their first error. Their hearts had grown cold. The state of the heart is of incredible importance to our Lord. It was, it was true back then. It is still true now. Look at what we read in 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal towards him. This is a prophet speaking to King Asa. The king had formed allies whom the Lord did not approve. Instead of relying on Jehovah to fight the battle, he formed allies with other kings. And this is where God saw an error a serious error in his heart. First Samuel 16, 7 says, and we will get to this later, 
For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The condition of the heart is of primary importance to our Lord. It was true back then. It is still true today. This was the first error the Israelites made. The second error the Israelites made is in the area of doctrine. And I was surprised this morning how many times in our worship the topic of doctrine came up. This is an area I feel Satan has always tried to attack the church. Because if you can get some confusion and some false doctrine and some corruption in the doctrine to come in, you can lead people in many different ways that are not pleasing to the Lord. Why is doctrine important? I found eight reasons why, and I'll explain them. Doctrine connects church to its historical roots. Doctrine teaches the believer how to think about God and his salvation. Doctrine shapes values and priorities of daily church ministry. Doctrine helps develop lifestyle habits for Christians. Doctrine impresses our essential beliefs upon the next generation. Doctrine helps build a framework for unity among church members. Doctrine teaches and informs believers how to engage theologically with other believers and with the general public. The doctrine is of prime importance to our Lord Jesus Christ. At the very heart of the definition of doctrine, it's a set of beliefs and principles that we believe. And Satan loves to attack this in the church. You know, I, I have a feeling what happened to the Israelites was, and this is speculation on my part, Satan worked in the heart of Philistines and got Philistines to also recognize Jehovah as a god. And they probably had some sacrifices or some uh, tribute paid to Jehovah in addition to their own God. And they probably told the Israelites, look, we consider your God, we recognize your God, why don't you do, you do the same? We are living in the same land, we've recognized your God is very powerful, why don't you consider our God? And I'm just speculating, but somehow the children of Israel disobeyed one of the commandments given to them many, many, many years ago about not having any other gods before them. And so this led them astray. It led them into certain behaviors and practices that were an abomination to Jehovah. And this was the second serious error that the children of Israel made. You know, these days, I don't think we are going to be worshiping a different god. But purity in doctrine is very important. And I see these days many denominations. With some, we have small differences in practice. With some, we have small differences in doctrine. But with others, we have major differences. And it's important for us to know the major differences. Denominations like the Jehovah's Witness, the Mormons, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Catholic faith, there are significant, significant doctrine, uh, doctrinal differences. We do have a different doctrine. And it's important for us to be pure in our doctrine. Another way Satan brings false doctrine into us is through worldly music, worldly movies, worldly traditions. You know, October is a time when a lot of people celebrate Halloween. Have you dug into the roots of Halloween, where it comes from? Okay, it, I don't see very much relationship to any of the biblical doctrines and Halloween. Okay, it is one of those things we got to be careful about when we go too deep into the celebration of Halloween. What else do we learn from here? The elders in a church have a prime responsibility to protect the flock and to teach the right doctrine because false doctrine can lead the flock astray. And so there is a responsibility for elders here. And you see Samuel as a leader correcting the children of Israel in the area of doctrine. Now, the third aspect is duty. Okay? Duty is of 
prime importance to our Lord. There are three areas where duty is mentioned. Uh, there are many duties for us as a Christian, but when I look at all the different things that are mentioned in the Bible, I see three things that stand out. One is obedience to Christ's commandments, and there are two things he has mentioned. One is baptism, and the second is the Lord's Supper. Okay? Baptism identifies us with the death of Christ, and the Lord's Supper is a remembrance gathering for us. The third one is the great commission that he's given us to go out into the world and preach the good news. So, starting with devotion, condition of the heart, setting your heart to love the Lord and be loyal to him, having the right doctrine, being able to discern right doctrine from wrong doctrine, and duty. These are the three things that I find in this verse that Samuel spoke to the children of Israel, and it was an effective message. And I believe today all three pieces apply to us Christians as we live our Christian life. Moving along. Verse 5. So Samuel has preached his message, and the children of Israel now obey. They put away their bells and the asterisks. The asterisks, what I've studied, is a female god, and Baal is supposed to be the male god. They served both of these, and they put these away. And Samuel said, gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered all Israel to Mizpah, drew water, and poured it out before the Lord. Verse 6. And they fasted that day and said, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mizpah. So I looked into what is the significance of Mizpah, because obviously Samuel is based out of Ramah. Why did he want people to go to Mizpah? Okay. The two cities are not that far. Okay, and I've circled where Mizpah is in, in relation to Ramah, probably a few miles away. But R Mizpah is a city of some significance to the children of Israel. The first mention of Mizpah in the Bible is the place where Jacob and Laban met and established a covenant with each other, not to attack each other, and wanted God to be a witness. And so Mizpah starts becoming a place of increasing importance as a place where promises are made. And maybe that's why Samuel chose Mizpah, to unite and gather all of Israel. You see, they also fasted and prayed. And fasting and prayer before the Lord expressed their sorrow and regret. And they sought his support there. I looked into the drawing of water and pouring it out before Jehovah. Okay? I'm not exactly sure what that signifies. It might signify a sign of weakness. It might signify a way of showing their submission to Jehovah, because we also see the same act being done by David when he was in battle and he sent three mighty men to a particular well to get water. When they got the water after great risk to their life and the water was brought to David, we see David pouring this water out. So I'm not sure of the exact significance of why they did this, but I do believe it's a sign of a sacrifice and a sign of submission before the Lord. They further express their sorrow by fasting on that day. And then we see Samuel judging Israel at that place. Judging means he taught, he corrected, he ex explained right from wrong, he settled disputes, and he probably encouraged the children of Israel. Ultimately, he was able to get the children of Israel right before Jehovah. And that was very significant. Because as we move down to verse 7, let's see what happened. 
Now, when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel had gathered together in Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel, and the children of Israel heard of it. They were afraid of the Philistines. So the children of Israel said to Samuel, did not cease to cry out to the Lord, our God, for us, that he might save us from the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. Then Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. Samuel, at this point, has three roles. He's a prophet, chosen of the Lord to be his messenger. He's also a priest in that he can offer sacrifices for the, uh, for the people. And he's also a judge. This massive gathering at Mizpah was probably seen by the Philistines as some sort of a movement within Israel to get together and threaten the Philistines. And so they said this threat needs to be diffused by force which is why they chose to challenge the children of Israel in battle. And what do we see the children of Israel doing? It's a sharp change in behavior from what we saw in chapters 4 and 5, where they took the ark into battle without seeking God's permission, forcing God into battle with them, thinking that will gain them victory. When we come to chapter 7, we see a repentant Israel now pleading with Samuel to pray for, uh, pray for them and give them deliverance from this uh, battle that is coming up. Significant difference after Israel has repented. The significance of the burnt offering. And, you know, there are many types of offerings that are mentioned in the Bible and many types of sacrifices that are mentioned in the Bible. But the burnt offering is a term that was first used when Noah came out of the ark uh, after the flood, and he offered burnt offerings. It's a tribute to God. The offering is different from other uh, offerings in that the whole animal is burnt upon the altar. No portion is kept back for eating like other sacrifices. It's, all, it's used and it's significance is to make peace with God for sin and to be granted a favor from God. We see the children of Israel when they were going through the wilderness after they sinned and worshiped the golden calf. We see them offering a burnt offering. So I believe Israel through their regret and to make peace with God offered this lamp as a burnt offering, and we see Samuel making this offering before the Lord. Verse 10, Now as Samuel was offering the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered that day with a loud thunder upon the Philistines and confused them so that they were overcome before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and drove them back far as Beth Car. Now, Beth Car, I, I couldn't uh, pinpoint Beth Car on this particular map. Uh, maybe some of you can research it further and find out its location. But when I look at these verses, you know, the Philistines thought that maybe, maybe when the Israelites are gathered together during their sacrifice, they are vulnerable and they are unlikely to attack them. And so they thought this is a good time to launch the attack. But what we see happening was the hand of Jehovah is with the children of Israel. And he thunders and creates a storm that is strong enough to confuse the Philistine army. You know, I wondered why did God not smite the Philistines? He could have done that. He killed many Philistines when the ark was in their possession. Why didn't God just send an angel and kill thousands of these Philistines? and create the victory. You know, this is where I believe there's a principle by which our God operates. He expects us to do our part in this life. He's given us skills. He's given us talents. We can do a lot with those. But things that are beyond our capability and things that belong in His domain, He expects us to leave it to Him. 
You know, the Israelites could not confuse the army of Philistines. They were a well-prepared army. They were men of war. They knew how to fight battles well. But God could confuse them, and that's what he did. So in summary, we see the children of Israel, when they turned their hearts to, God, to Jehovah and obeyed his leader, they got Jehovah's help. And it helped them win a significant win in this battle with the Philistines. The victory is lasting, there is peace, and there's a memorial being built. That's what we read in verse 12, 13, and 14. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen and called its name Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued. They did not come anymore into the territory of Israel, and the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Verse 14, then the cities of the Philistines, which the Philistines had taken from Israel, were restored to Israel, from Ekron to Gath. And Israel recovered its territory from the hands of the Philistines, and there was also peace between Israel and the Amorites. Verse 13 talks about a stone that is being set as a memorial for the children of Israel to remember how the Lord delivered them from Philistine rule. You know, Psalm 103 talks about us being grateful. It reads, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, crowns you with loving kindness. And that's what we see here happening. The stone is set up by Samuel as a memorial between Mizpah and Shen. We also read the Philistines were subdued and they did not come into the territory of Israel anymore. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. There's a nice verse that I think is a promise God has given to the children of Israel. And I believe it's a promise given to us also. And that's in Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue that rises against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. This is the promise God gave the children of Israel, and he kept his word while he was their God, and the children of Israel followed him. Verse 15, And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. He went from year to year on a circuit to Bethel, to Gilgal, and Mizpah, and judged Israel in all those places. But he always returned to Ramah, for his home was there, and there he judged Israel, and there he built an altar to the Lord. This is the end of chapter 17. What we see is there is peace, there is stability. The children of Israel are now set right in their ways with God. Their heart is correct before him. The false doctrines and the false gods are removed. They are in obedience and in submission to Jehovah, and there is peace and stability. And we see Samuel doing his ministry as a judge, as a priest, and as a prophet in Israel, where he moves from town to town. And I've highlighted in Blue Arrow the three cities that he circulated by. He probably walked. It's several, maybe five, six miles between each city. And he continues his ministry. What we also see is in Rama, he built an altar to the Lord. And that is significant because you see him establish his connection with Jehovah and continually being in his will. And that gave him the strength to judge Israel and to preside over them. It also prepared him for the next test that he's going to uh, encounter, which is in chapter 8, where because of some of the things his children did, the Israelites have now had an objection, and they are now asking for a king. That's a difficult test for someone as a leader when the people reject you. And you see how S uh, Samuel very amicably handled that particular situation. We'll cover that in 
uh, next week's uh, message, but I wanted to summarize the key points from chapter 7. First, God honors those who honor him. When the Israelites despised the commandments of the Lord and did things that were against his will, we see God subjected them to bondage, and they lost the battles with great loss of life. And it's the same God that's with us today. He honors those who honor him. Second, devotion, duty, and doctrine. These are the blueprint elements for a revival. And we see Samuel bringing this message. Devotion speaks to the heart, setting the heart straight. And this is important for us today. This is where the Lord looks first. Even if you don't have all your doctrines perfect, he looks to see, is your heart really seeking after him? Second aspect, doctrine. It's an area where Satan constantly likes to attack the church and create confusion because he can use this to lead the people of God astray. Watch and guard our doctrine. You know, when I look at our website, we have uh, the statement of faith. Okay, there are 10 of them that explain the major doctrines we believe in. Study those. Make sure you understand why they are there and what its significance is in our life. And be ready to deflect and spot false doctrine because it creeps very subtly into a church. And the third point is, it's the Lord that gives the victory, but we are called as Christians to do the work. So may these points from chapter 7 be of encouragement and edification to the saints here as we close this chapter. Let's look to the Lord in prayer, and then we will end the meeting. Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the life of Samuel. Even though it is 3,000 years ago, we thank you your word is powerful, and it speaks to us even today. May the words that were spoken here be of edification to the saints so that they can continue to lead a strong and victorious Christian life. Now as we depart, pray that your presence may go with us and keep us safe until we meet again if it's your will and you tarry. These things I ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.